thank you all very much for your, your patience. Um, I might kick it off again. Um, it's got me a little bit more relaxed this time, so um, it won't be too bad. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for jumping on board um, to join in our Kickstart Your Career webinar with Interchange Lod and Mally. Um, we're looking at the session going for about an hour, um, a little bit less, a little bit longer, just depending on the questions that we receive from, from you guys. Um, so if you do have any questions, just jump into the chat um, and ask them along the way. Um, we do have a few people um, who are presenting today and they'll uh, be introduced as we go along. Uh, we will be sharing some poll questions uh, just to get to know you a little bit better. Um, so feel free to uh, throw them in as well. Uh, we've got attached uh, to this link a position description for our current vacancies, and we'll go through those positions uh, in a little bit more detail shortly. Uh, finally, we've got a few uh, featured actions to help connect with our social media. So make sure you jump on there and, and have a look. Uh, we will be recording this webinar. Uh, and we'll be uploaded to our social media accounts uh, in the next couple of hours. So if you really enjoyed this session and you want to get someone else to jump in and, and jump on and have a look at it, um, you can always just share the link and get them to have a look. Um, I did do an acknowledgement of country at the start of this um, session with our technical difficulties. Um, so I might just run back through and just do that again. Um, so we're streaming to you from the ancestral lands of the Jara people today. We acknowledge their continuing culture and the contribution their, sorry, they make to the life of this city. We recognise that our services operate on the traditional lands of, me, lands of many clans. We respect them as the traditional custodians of Lod and Mallee and celebrate the unique cultural and spiritual contribution they make to the fabric of our diverse region and communities. We pay our respect to their elders past and present. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you now um, our CEO here at Interchange, who is Jeanette Martin. And Jeanette will be speaking to you just a little bit of an overview about uh, what's happening in the NDIS environment and the disability sector with uh, here in Interchange Lod and Mallee and across the Lod and Mallee regions. Thank you very much. everybody and thank you all so much for um, joining this webinar. Uh, I'm uh, very hopeful that you will get some um, really good information that will help you um, sort out uh, where you want to go uh, in your career. Um, so firstly, um, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the disability sector um, and what's happening in the world of the NDIS. If we go back to about 2010, um, the, uh, the sector was very much aware that um, things weren't working uh, properly. Um, and on the back of that, the federal government um, asked the Productivity Commission to um, do an inquiry into the disability sector across the nation. And um, not surprisingly, um, the Productivity Commission's findings were that the disability support services in each state across the nation were just simply not working. Um, so uh, in 2013, uh, the um, NDIS Act was passed. And um, over the um, next three years, the um, uh, what was contained within the Act was trialled across um, various uh, various states, Tasmania, uh, New South Wales, Victoria. Um, and then in 2016, um, the um, NDIS formally started to roll out um, and it will finish its full rollout across the nation this year. Uh, <clears throat> the NDIS, um, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, um, is managed by uh, an agency called the NDIA, not surprisingly, the National Disability Insurance Agency. Um, and there is also an independent commission called the Quality and Safeguards Commission. Um, and the role of that commission is to ensure, as it says in its name, um, that the um, the services that are delivered uh, to participants uh, are of a high standard uh, and also um, are delivered in a safe way. 
So what were the major changes that the NDIS brought? Up until the inception of the NDIS, uh, each state um, funded um, its own version of disability services. The, uh, the money that uh, was put into the, um, uh, the sector would go to organisations and if an individual um, needed to leave to go into state or to go to another region within a state, the money that was providing that person's support stayed with the organisation. It didn't go with the participant. So uh, under the NDIS, that's probably the number one change in that um, the money um, that is provided to support an individual participant uh, goes with that participant, follows that participant wherever they need to move. Uh, and that's a, uh, an absolutely significant um, uh, change. And that's the, uh, the whole premise of the NDIS is to give people living with disability um, maximum choice and control um, over uh, their lives. And certainly having the funding um, and able, being able to control that funding and being able to purchase services um, where they, uh, they wish to live or where they wish to have those services provided is a, a absolutely um, the number one fundamental change of the NDIS. Um, for organisations, rather than organisations getting a big bulk bucket of money at the beginning of a financial year, um, services now um, are paid in arrears and we effectively have to send the NDIA an account for the services that we've provided. So that's uh, certainly a, um, a massive change um, for service providers. Um, and uh, the, other, uh, the other significant change is that um, rather than um, kind of coasting along with a surety from providers that you know, the state funded bucket of money would continue to flow. We're now in a very competitive world where a participant can choose to purchase services from an organisation or leave an organisation. Um, and there are, because the, the NDIS is um, what's called an entitlement um, uh, initiative, uh, it means that um, you don't necessarily have to sit on a waiting list um, waiting for uh, an opportunity to open up. Um, and so that means that um, it is uh, much more competitive um, and there are many more um, organisations and operators coming into the sector so that um, organisations have to be very aware of um, how, how, how they sit within the, the disability sector and they must make sure that um, customer service um, is uh, one of the, the number one objectives. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of um, interchange, um, if we go back to the very, very early 80s, um, there was a lady who had um, um, in Melbourne who had a little boy with a, an intellectual disability and she and her family were um, Oh, she and her, her, the father of the little boy were, were managing um, the little boy's needs plus the, the needs of um, the other uh, brothers and sisters in the family. And she realised that if she didn't get a spell every now and then, um, that the, the family was going to disintegrate. So she um, organised some volunteers to um, invite the little boy into their homes and effectively uh, host respite, as we know it, um, was born. And uh, that happened in, in Camberwell in Melbourne. And from there, lots of other areas adopted that model um, where volunteers invited children living with a disability um, into their homes so that the families uh, had some respite. And the, the name that was, I guess, coined back then was uh, Interchange. And so uh, there consequently were a number of uh, Interchange organisations that sprung up across the state, um, across New South Wales and across Western Australia. Um, for Interchange Lodden Mallee region, we started in 1983 um, under... 
under the same program um, of host respite um, as, um, as the other interchanges. And whilst we currently have um, a number of different program areas, we still do um, host um, programming uh, for respite. Um, <clears throat> we've got um, a, um, uh, an office, as you know, here in Bendigo. We've also got an office in Mildura and we provide services um, in Swan Hill. Um, what um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is what do we value here at, um, at Interchange Love and Mallee? Certainly for uh, our participants, we, we value um, the, um, the right of um, any one of our participants to have maximum uh, choice and control over his or her own life. Um, we, we believe in equality. Um, we certainly believe in independence um, and uh, dignity uh, and respect. Um, basic and fundamental human rights that, that everybody um, should be able to have uh, in their in their life. If um, you um, decide that you would like to apply for a position at um, Interchange Lodden Mallee Region and you are successful, uh, you will find that you enjoy that you uh, have joined a um, a family um, of um, support providers. Um, we like to. Um, definitely like to consider that each each one of us who works for uh, Interchange Lodden and Mallee is uh, is part of a of a family, um, and I would also um, say that should you decide to uh, join this sector and um, should you successfully join the sector, then um, you will um, be um, entering into one of the most um, privileged and the most wonderful aspects of your life because um, to know that the support that you provide uh, makes a difference in somebody's life is um, a, um, a, an amazing experience. So uh, I wish you well um, in your um, career pursuits uh, and I hope that um, you know we, we see you in the future. Um, I'd like to um, now introduce you to Brandon. Brandon's a team leader uh, in our participant coordination area, and he's going to uh, talk to you uh, about the, um, the roles of our community facilitators. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Brandon, I'm the team leader of the um, participant support team um, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the role of a community facilitator um, and I'd like to start off um, by giving you a little bit of a background um, to how the process works and how um, you come to support participants. Um, so um, initially, a participant would participant would come to us with um, an NDIS plan. Um, in that plan, they may have funding to have support. Um, so when they come to us with that with that plan, um, in that plan they'll have goals. Um, so we um, meet with the participants and their families, and we um, uh, get an idea of their goals and how they want to achieve that. Um, and then it's up to us to link them, uh, to determine how we're going to, to provide that support and what the sessions are going to look like um, and put some steps in place to, um, so that they can best achieve those goals. Um, that's where a community facilitator comes into the picture. Um, so we link up uh, a participant with a community facilitator. Um, and something we really pride ourselves on is um, our ability to match participants with the, the best support worker, the best community facilitator for them. Um, so once we um, gather all that information and, and link you to a, to a participant, um, you would support that participant um, for various different reasons. So um, based on the participant's goals. So for an example, um, participants' goals might be based around um, independent living skills. 
Uh, it could be to access the community, um, various different reasons. So um, we, we meet with you and talk about the participant and, and run through their goals and come up with a bit of a plan of how, how we're going to work as a team to achieve those goals for that participant and achieve the best outcomes. Um, so if we use the example of um, to you know, improve their daily living skills, you might be supporting that participant. Um, it could be once a week, it could be twice a week, um, depending on what's in their, their plan for their funds. Um, and we implement um, a care plan. So ev for every session, session you work with that participant, um, we give you a, bit, a plan. It'll have all your session details, all the information you need to know in that plan um, so that you can provide the best support possible to that participant. Um, so if we're, as I said, that example of a participant um, working on their independent living skills, it might be that, um, you know, over the duration of their, their plan that you will be supporting them to cook um, and cook their own meals and um, complete their domestic duties around the house. Um, that's just one example and we um, we track the progress that the participants make with that. Um, each session as a community facilitator you would report on. Um, so we get, you will complete a session reporting sheet um, and that's how you track how the participants going and how they're um, working towards achieving that goals um, and that information is vital to us as coordinators. Um, we report that back to um, the NDIA so that um, we can determine, you know, what's what's the next steps in the future to, to um, maintain that goal or to better achieve that goal. Um, uh, another example might be that a participant, uh, their goal might be to access the community. Perhaps they can't can't do the regular things that we take for granted um, without having support. So it might be that um, you know, you take them to do their weekly shopping. Um, it might be that they can't go and go and have a meal out on a Friday night, um, so that they need support to do that. So you know, the whole process of um, getting there, uh, ordering their meal, sitting down, eating their meal, paying for the meal, all those things. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a background of of um, the role of a community facilitator with our one to one support. Um, something we also offer at Interchange are uh, group programs, um, which is uh, very popular amongst our participants, uh, particularly those that do have goals around um, accessing the community, socialising and um, meeting new people, making new friends, things like that. Um, so we offer a wide range of different group programs that um, specifically target um, those specific goals, I suppose. Um, uh, just as, as an example, we run um, an adult social group. Um, we do that in Bendigo and Mildura. Um, so it's a, a great opportunity as a community facilitator because not only do you get to work with a wide range of participants with different um, needs and support requirements, but you also get to work in a team with other community facilitators. Um, so an example of that might be that, um, you know, going out for dinner, um, we regularly have groups of you know 15 to 20 participants all catching up together on a, on a Friday night to go and um, have a meal maybe see lots some live music um, and for many of our participants that's um, that's their social outing and they, they count down the days for it um, and it's a it's a really um, really positive experience and as I said it, you get to um, learn so much more and get, be exposed to so many different opportunities in those group situations so um, they're, they're the two main aspects uh, of the role of the community facilitator. Um, it's a very rewarding role, very fulfilling, knowing that you get to um, make a difference in the community and ultimately, um, you know, enhance the lives of, um, of the people we support. Um, I think that's about all. Thank you very much for um, joining us and, and listening to me today and I'll pass on to Eli, back to Eli, who's going to talk about our after school hours care program. Thank you. Just when you all thought you were getting rid of me, I'm bouncing back up and uh, you'll see me again before the end of the session. So I uh, am very lucky uh, to be speaking today about our Outside School Hours Care programs. 
uh, both at the Special Development School in Bendigo and Kalyana School. Um, unfortunately, Hope Jury, who's our uh, project manager, is unable to, to be here today. Um, so I feel very, very lucky to be speaking uh, about such a um, exciting program that we're delivering here uh, at Interchange. So the programs uh, at both schools are part of a statewide demonstration program. There are six sites uh, across the state in which uh, services are being provided to children living with a disability uh, for services to access outside school hours care outside a mainstream setting. Uh, so for those of you who have had children go to after school care in a mainstream setting, um, or for those of you who've worked in after school care in a mainstream setting, um, you'll know that uh, you'll go in and it's full of laughter and, and full of lots of fun. Um, and it can be pretty chaotic. Um, there's lots of children around. Um, there's generally a couple of staff members. Um, in those settings, ratios are 1 to 15. Uh, and as we know, the children who we're supporting don't always fit into those levels of support. They need a little bit more. They might need one-to-one -one support, one-to-two, one-to-three. Um, so part of this demonstration program is to create uh, a service model in which those children can be well supported uh, so that they can reach their potential and be exposed and experience all of those things that the children in a mainstream setting do. Uh, whilst also making sure that they're involved in their local community. And that is the, the biggest goal for this program, uh, is to make sure that children are embedded into their community and surrounded by their community. Uh, so the Outside School Care programs op operate from 3pm uh, till 6pm uh, on a Monday through to a Friday. Uh, and we run school holiday programs from 8am through till 6pm. Um, the programs are full of excitement and passion um, we have activities that are targeted to each individual child. We've got, uh, if you go to the special development school, you'll see staff members working one-to-one -one or one-to-two capacities, um, creating really unique experiences for children. Uh, so whether it is um, things that are really tactile or things with noise, um, we've got modified bikes, uh, which is really, really important for those children um, to make sure they're really accessible. Um, when you're going to Kaliana, we're seeing some really exciting things come out of that program. Um, we've got some of our children uh, who are in their later years in school, so our teenagers, who are engaging in uh, computer coding, uh, which gives them a really great stepping stone to a career path and to really get them to feel their way through all of their strengths. Um, if you were to be looking at engaging uh, in employment with us in the Outside School Hours Care Program, um, there's some great opportunities that you'll be exposed to. Um, not only the great people that we support uh, and the staff around it, but um, unlike a mainstream program, we have two staff members, the educational leader and the two IC, who are outside the ratio, uh, and they're to support the other staff members and to support the children. So if there's a child that's having some difficulty transitioning from school to after school care, because it can be a challenge, uh, then there is an extra staff member there to support them through that, to support the staff member in finding ways for the child to re-engage into that um, in environment. Um, we also do a lot of staff training as part of that um, service. So we do things like keyword sign, uh, understanding autism, trauma-informed practice, asthma, anaphylaxis, there's child protection training. Um, we believe it's really, really important to have a high level training workforce or workforce plan to make sure that staff members are well equipped to provide the support to those children in our services. Uh, we are lucky enough to have um, a lot of resources go into this program. It's very, very important. Um, some of the needs of the children are quite specific, which means some of the resources that the children require to engage in experiences needs to be quite specific as well. We do all of the great things that many outside school care programs do. So we've had groups going to the museum and go to the zoo. Um, we've had some really great um, cultural based activities based on the children's culture, um, really wanting to make sure that they're really bringing their uh, feelings, their emotions, their uh, family environment, their uh, community into the after school care community, and then taking that after school care community and accessing the, the wider community. So um, the children go shopping uh, to the supermarket to buy 
um, the afternoon tea resources when it's not COVID. COVID throws a bit of a <laughs> throws us in a bit of a tiz, um, but uh, we have been able to do that. They're accessing the local gyms, particularly important for those children. Um, who are getting older and wanting to access their local gym and providing those community networks early to make sure that they know where to go, they know who to go to. Um, we've got great connections um, with other providers like Headspace. Um, we're doing some stuff with Beyond Blue, uh, really great connections in the school community with the welfare team to make sure that the children are really, really supported uh, in transitioning from school to after school care to home. Uh, really creating a beautiful environment around them. The team that works in the outside school house care program are extremely, extremely passionate. Um, and if you ever get a chance to be there, um, you will see that. We've got a little video uh, to show you in a moment that really shows all of the great things that are happening in this program. It shows all the passion, all the excitement uh, on a general day in a outside school hours care with Interchange. Um, so please stay with us for a couple of moments while we get the video up and running. Having a huge amount of fun, engagement in their day, but importantly for families who now have that flexibility that they just didn't have before. That extra two or three hours or during the holidays, that one or two weeks respite or the ability to extend their working hours is value that we really can't measure. It's really made a difference in my life. I feel like I can go to work without being stressed and constantly checking my phone to see if I've got missed calls or messages. And I can say that it's been one of the best holidays that my boys have had in a long time. There is nothing more frightening for a parent who has a child with special needs and you are putting your child into the hands of somebody else and whether or not you can trust that they get it. I cannot express how important these programs are for our family and for my boy. I love the staff, how they interact and spend time with you and your friends. And, um, you can have awesome conversations about yeah, just anything. Express your emotions. And nice. Can you tell us about your hat? I am a witch. You're a yes. witch. I um, am just such a believer. When you help a child and when you support a child to learn, that grows them, that grows their family, and ultimately that grows our community. And I don't know of a better way to do that that goes across the boundaries that are often separated by the school gates than, than this program. Thank you very much for the opportunity. We hope that it continues for a long, long time and is part of uh, a key mantra and a key pillar for what the education state and the whole state of Victoria is trying to achieve. So thank you once again. Talk to the parents, the grandparents, the carers. Without these types of programs, they would be absolutely lost. Funding is important and, and we need it. And if we can do that and we build up these individuals, they could be amazing members of our society. Some of the teachers have inspired me to grow as a human being because I just want to be there for the kids. I really want to um, inspire them to be whatever they can be. I will uh, hand over in a moment to our SIL team leader, Tanya. Um, but for those of you who uh, haven't seen those videos before, um, I am extremely proud of the work that the team has been doing um, on, on those programs. Um, if you get an opportunity, I would really strongly suggest you jump onto our Facebook page and have a look at the, the two videos specifically linked to the Special Development School here in Bendigo and the Kaliana School. Um, it is absolutely heartwarming and um, 
beautiful to to see the interactions with the children and and the way the families and the staff members talk um, about what the service is doing for the local community. Um, for me personally, being involved in the filming over the three days, um, it's quite emotional watching it back um, because it was uh, really, really touching to hear the engagement with those families uh, and the difference that the service is making to those people in the community. So um, I'm going to hand over to Tanya, who's our SIL uh, team leader, uh, which is supported independent living, uh, and she'll be able to talk to you about the opportunities we have. Hi everyone, uh, apologies, a bit of uh, microphone issues there again. <laughs> um, so as Eli said, so I'm the um, supported in the independent living um, team leader. Um, supported independent living is new to um, a new program for interchange. Um, but as Jeanette and Brandon have touched on, that uh, we've been providing these similar supports for some time now. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, supported independent, independent living, so SIL, um, is an NDIS funded um, program and that funding pays for the support workers to support the participants to live as independently as possible in their home. Um, so what does SIL funding cover? So um, SIL covers the supports for personal care, so um, activities of daily living, um, that could, you know, depending on the individual, personal care, um, so showering, dressing, toileting, um, mobility, meal, prepara meal preparation. And as I said earlier, it all depends on the individual as to how much support um, the participant will need. Um, you'll be um, helping them to, to participate in activities in the household, um, managing the household tasks, like I said earlier, preparing the meals, cleaning, etc. Um, so with your SEAL funding, we have um, two levels of funding. So you have your standard needs, which is a, your regular um, 24 hours active assistance with, with most daily tasks. And then you have your high needs, where the participant requires um, continual and more complex assistive needs. Um, so as I said earlier, it all depends on the individual and the people that are living, living in the house. Um, I can go over some duties um, that will be performed by the, the staff that will be in this area. Um, it'll be a sleepover of an evening um, and there will be um, you know, a, an area for staff um, to, to, to sleep over in an office and all that sort of stuff there. But some of the duties that will be performed will be, like I said earlier, support with your personal care, and that could be support with all aspects or as simple as some supervision. But, you know, your bathing, showering, uh, drying, um, assistance with getting dressed to even um, helping them choose what to wear for the day, um, preparing, assisting with their breakfast um, and their morning routine. Uh, support with getting organised for the, the day and the possibility of support to get to their day program or work. Um, the participants in the, the, the house will be um, supported not through the SIL funding between the hours of nine till three. And normally, um, this is during the week, sorry, and normally they're um, at work or um, on a day program and then the afternoon will start around three o'clock. Um, some of the, the supports in the afternoon, um, so supporting the residents when they return from home, um, once again, that's on an individual basis. 
Um, you know, some people might just want to have some um, time to themselves when they return home or, um, you know, like to talk about how their day went. Um, support with preparing the afternoon to tea, afternoon tea. Uh, once again, support around general household tasks, washing, tidying the room, all that sort of stuff. Um, assistance with medication and um, supporting the residents in their, their evening routine, whether that's personal care or, or what they like to do in the evening. Um, it may be necessary as well to take the residents to medical appointments or um, appointments throughout the evening. Um, currently, um, we have positions advertised for our new um, board and in the independent living area. Um, they're advertised to be closed um, Monday the 23rd, which is this Monday. Um, but if anyone is interested at all, um, we'll leave those open until close of business on Tuesday. So Tuesday the 24th by close of business. And um, I think on the website as well, it'll show where to, to send your um, applications through to. Um, I will finish up and if there's any questions, um, the guys will let me know and I can jump back on and ask questions. But surprise, I'm throwing back to Eli again. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone. the last little bit, um, usually this be taken on by a HR department, but unfortunately they're unable to make it today. Um, but if you do have any questions uh, at the end of this webinar, uh, if you've still got some burning questions we didn't get to answer today, or if you're still unclear on the process, uh, all of the details will be um, in the information that's been provided. Oh. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> ah, beautiful technology. We're having fun with it today. <laughs> so I'll just quickly go back over. Um, if there are any questions that anyone does have at the end of this webinar, some burning questions you didn't get to ask today, or if there's anything we didn't cover, uh, all of the information will be available. Um, uh, all the contact details, sorry, will be available for our HR department who will be able to answer any of your questions if you do so have any. Um, so just in this last little section, just wanted to go through um, some of the positions that we do have currently available. Um, what study or experience we're, we're looking for staff members to have, um, as well as some compliance uh, items that you would need to have organised when applying. Um, so in regards to uh, what qualifications we ask staff members to have, um, those people who are studying or have experience in aged care, allied health, children's services, community services, disability services, education, individual support, mental health, uh, are more than welcome to apply. Um, we do acknowledge that there are just some people who just have that passion, that drive, that gift for working with people. Uh, and we do take that into consideration. So if you don't have a formal qualification in one of those areas or an area that you feel can be transferable, um, please do apply um, because we will keep those in consideration. We've got people who work with us here who started off life in factories, who had family members or um, joined a local cricket club um, with members in the cricket club who um, were living with a disability. They found their passion and they came to work with us here at Interchange. Um, so just because you don't have a formal qualification doesn't mean that you shouldn't apply, always apply. It's uh, very, very important. Um, when we're looking at our compliance, we do require staff members to have a um, police check. So we actually uh, complete that for you. So we just need 100 points of identification, which is all in the paperwork. Uh, you do need a working children's uh, working with children's check. Um, you do need to have your level two first aid and CPR before you uh, are able to commence work. Uh, and you do need to fill out the disability worker exclusion scheme.
paperwork. Um, now, for those of you who haven't been involved in this industry before, uh, the Disability Workout Exclusion Scheme um, has been brought in over the last couple of years, um, and it's to ensure that people who are in the disability sector um, are working uh, with the respective individuals um, and that if there's any misconduct that occurs from one agency to another, that those um, people living with a disability are protected. Um, so we do ask that anyone who comes and works with us uh, does uh, enter their details into the Disability Worker Exclusion Scheme. Um, so currently we have a number of vacancies uh, for positions here with Interchange. Uh, so we've got, as Tanya said, the residential support workers, we've got the residential house supervisor, we've got outside school hours care educators at both Kaliana site and SDS site, we've got community facilitator positions in Bendigo and Mildura, uh, which are all open up on our website at the moment. So how to apply for a job with us? So if you jump on our website, it has all of the information there. If you have any troubles with it, please get in contact with us. We don't want to create any barriers um, than what there already are. You will see there are a lot of paperwork, unfortunately. It is just the industry that we work in, um, and it does just come with those things that we need to have filled out. Um, so please ask those questions. If you're having trouble with any of the paperwork, if you're having trouble with the application, don't be afraid to give us a call. We're more than happy to talk you through it. Um, if you need someone to sit down with you and talk through key selection criteria or anything like that, just let us know. Um, as I said, there is a lot of paperwork. Um, it is important that it is all completed. It does tie up the recruitment process if it is all not completed. If you are unsure if you've got it all there, as I said, give us a call, ask for HR, have a chat to them about it and say, I think I've got everything, but I might be missing one or two things. Can you go through it with me? Um, they'll let you know either way um, if you don't have it all there. Our preferred methods for applications to come in is uh, via email. Again, that's on our website. Um, if you don't have email, if your email's down, if you just don't have time to send the email, um, don't be afraid to hit us up on our social media pages and we'll find a way for you to get all of the information in. That is it from me in regards to the recruitment process um, for any of those positions. We're gonna take some time to answer some of your questions. Uh, there are uh, a number of us in the room. We can't all get on the camera because of COVID. So you're gonna have me again for a little while. So I do apologize. Um, I wish I had a you know better face, Zac Efron or something like that, but I don't. Um, so we're gonna leave it <laughs> as it is. So if you have any questions, please throw them into the chat. Um, we'll stay on for a couple of more minutes and answer que any questions that you have. I have just been passed um, a couple of questions that came through prior to the session today um, that a couple of people have asked after seeing the um, webinar. So one of the questions that we've got um, is, I'm still studying, should I wait until I graduate to apply for a job with Interchange? Um, so I think it's really important that um, anyone who is studying at the moment, um, yes, you're, you're studying and um, it's, uh, you're aiming to get a qualification. But as I said before, if you've got those life skills, if you feel prepared um, to jump in and, and to, to have a go, um, we're more than happy to be here and support you through that. Um, we do have a number of people who are studying their diploma or certificate four in disability. Um, we have a number of people who, um, who are studying um, nursing or teaching, um, a number of those degrees. So I would strongly encourage you, if you are studying, to just jump on board um, and to uh, apply anyway. Uh, so I've just had a question come through. Um, do all the positions require me to have comprehensive vehicle insurance? Um, so you will see on the community facilitator um, position description and the residential support worker positions, um, we do require staff members to have comprehensive car insurance. Uh, part of the reason for that is uh, that we do ask uh, staff members to transport participants in their own vehicle. Um, there is situations we do have staff members who don't feel comfortable with that or are unable to get comprehensive car insurance. Um, we do have uh, a couple of work vehicles here with Interchange um, that staff members are able to use. 
Um, however, most staff members find it uh, easier to use their own vehicle. Um, so it wouldn't be required for the outside schoolhouse care educator positions, um, but it is required for or it is preferred for the um, community facilitator and residential support worker positions. Um, so I've just got another question here. Um, sorry, just looking through. If no formal qualifications, but have life skills in many areas, does interchange support and assist staff members to commence and engage in formal training? Um, yeah, absolutely. We've got no problems with supporting staff members um, in engaging in uh, formal training. Um, so we will have um, some training opportunities, as I spoke before, um, in managing challenging behaviours, understanding autism, um, keyword sign, uh, a couple of those qualifications along the way. But if you are looking more for a Cert 4 um, or a diploma, we can definitely get you or support you in engaging with um, the local TAFE. We've really got a great connection with Bendigo TAFE here, um, so we'd have no problem supporting you in doing so. Uh, very good question. So I had a question asking what the NDIS worker orientation module listed on the application covering sheet is. So um, the orientation module is uh, modules that have been released by the NDIA uh, and it is a requirement for all staff members working in the NDIS field to complete those modules uh, and they do need to be completed before um, you are able to commence work. Uh, so we do ask that they're completed as part of your application. They're actually really fantastic modules. Um, they really highlight um, some of the challenges that people with disability may have in having a support worker and making sure that you clearly understand your roles and responsibility as a support worker. Um, so although it's a requirement, they're actually really, really fantastic um, modules. Some of them a little bit uh, show some more subtle things that you might not pick up in a day-to-day -day interaction with someone, um, but really get you to focus on how we can do things a little bit differently. Uh, I've got another one. Uh, do you pay the kilometres used to transport the participants on our own car? We sure do. So there is a reimbursement that goes along with the staff members pay. Um, it is uh, paid back at the award rate. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know it off the top of my head, um, but uh, you feel free to ask HR if you've got any more questions about that. Um, thank you very much, Anna. I hope I answered your question all right. Um, what are we looking for most in an applicant? Um, it's a really great question. Um, and it is something that is always really challenging. Um, I personally love an interview, uh, being on the other side of the interview, being on the panel, not so much being interviewed. Um, we do try to make our interviews as relaxed as possible. Um, it's more of a conversation. Yes, we've got some questions that we need to tick and flick, um, but we do try to keep it more of a conversation where we can. Um, what we're looking for is people that are passionate, people that want to really be a part of this industry, um, who want to help people, um, and that that can really, really show through when um, they're answering those questions or um, in their key selection criteria. That's really important that when you are answering those questions, take your time, go through and reread it and make sure you're answering the question that's been asked. Um, we can see through an application the passion and the drive that someone has. It's very, very clear. Um, and that's what we're really, really looking for. Um, we can teach a lot of the things that you need to know about the role. Um, what we can't teach is the passion and the drive that someone needs to support someone living with a disability. Because um, it can be challenging. It, it's not all rainbows and sunshines and coffees and teas and um, movie theatres and parks. Um, some of it is really, really challenging work. Um, and I don't want anyone um, to feel like that it's going to be rainbows and sunshines all the time. Um, some of it can be really challenging. So, um, Thanks, Danielle. Uh, can you still apply if you don't have first aid or CPR yet? Um, Natalie, you absolutely can. Um, I would just ask that if you are uh, intending to apply, um, that you book in the course sooner rather than later. Um, so even if you can just show that you've booked in, um, you might not have the qualification under your belt yet, um, but at least you've, you've booked in ready to go. Um, and we keep that in mind as part of the application. We understand that um, most people don't go and get those qualifications until they've got a job that they know they're, they're going to get into um, or uh, that they know 
uh, particularly with COVID, that um, it's going to be lasting long enough that it'll get them through at least the first 12 months. So that's absolutely fine. Uh, so I've got another question here. If I'm only available to work certain days and hours, can I still apply for the community facilitator position? You certainly can. Um, we have a wide range of staff members here um, on hours. So some people who have full-time availability and who work almost full-time hours or full-time hours. Um, and then we have some people who uh, might have a part-time job somewhere else and want to do a little bit more with another agency um, or another industry. So we definitely have people on far range um, of scales there. Um, so that wouldn't be a problem. Um, definitely apply. Um, if you're interested, interested, apply. There is a form there that asks about availability that helps us um, work out where some areas you might be suited to or um, what availability you've got, uh, particularly when it comes to our group programs opening up. Um, some of them are more after hours supports. Um, after nine to five or, or on weekends. Oh, Anna, great, great question. Uh, so Anna just asked, with the pay rates, does this go off your qualification experience or just the base rate? Also, can I work for three months while on study break and reduce to one day a week whilst completing my diploma? Um, so we do have uh, a base rate. Um, uh, initially, it is something that we are looking at with human resources. Uh, about how we acknowledge experience and uh, length of service here at Interchange. Uh, at this point in time, it is a, a base rate. Um, and our circumstances, sorry, covered my mouth, no one probably heard me. Um, and our circumstances do change in people's lives. And, and as an agency, we do understand that. Um, so if you were, you're looking at coming in um, and your availability might be ABC, um, and then in six months time, three months time, your availability changes, um, and that's okay. We do just ask that you're honest with us um, uh, as part of your application um, so that we can make sure that we're honest with the participants, which is really important, um, particularly if you're applying for that community facilitator job or a, um, or a house role, um, residential role, sorry. Um, it is really important that we're, we're upfront and honest with those participants. So we might say that, You've, we've got this fantastic worker, Anna, and she's going to jump on board, um, but uh, she can be here for three months with you. And, you know, after that, she's got to finish off her studies and she'll be completing it as soon as she can, I'm sure, and, and jump back on board with more sessions. So that's not a problem. Um, so with the last 12 years working in uh, as a AHA in hospitals, have a cert four in allied health, assisting prior. Uh, Ah, would it be appropriate for you to apply with these qualifications? Um, absolutely. Um, we are looking for people with a range of qualifications and skills. Nina, um, I would imagine you have in your uh, career have experienced a wide range of experiences that would mean um, that you could be possibly very suitable for a role um, in any of those departments. Um, I would strongly recommend that that you apply for the position just because you don't have a qualification in disability specifically doesn't mean that you're not one of the caring people um, that we'd be looking for for a role. Um, is it possible to meet, move between interchange agencies around Victoria? Um, what a great question. <laughs> um, Natalie, we as an incorporated body, um, we stand alone. Uh, we have our own board uh, here locally uh, between Bendigo and Mildura in the Lot and Mallee region. Um, however, if you were looking at moving from one interchange to another, um, the beauty of starting with us is that we could send through all of your, with your approval, send through all of your information to another interchange, which hopefully would make a expedient uh, recruitment for you. Um, we do have some really great connections with some other interchange um, incorporated organisations across the state and into New South Wales. So if that was something that you were interested in, um, it would just be a matter of the two HR departments talking and uh, myself or Jeanette talking to um, those people at CEO or operational level to um, get that up and running. Um, probably got time for one more question if anyone's got anything burning. You've been very good to keep chatting. It's um, I'm loving all the questions. Unfortunately, the other people in the room are, are sitting back, but um, I'm happy to keep uh, answering any more. 
Um, so uh, the assisted living position with working hours, what hours are available? Tan, do you want to come and answer that or are you happy for me to? Tanya is just handling that back to me. I'm thinking she doesn't want to get back on the camera. <laughs> um, but we do have a number of positions available. Um, the house supervisor position um, is around about 68 hours. Um, um, and there are the other positions. Um, uh, it just depends on the, the roster of care. So it's all been set up um, with the participants in mind and their needs. So there's a couple of hours throughout there, depending on the position, um, Anna and, and the people who are successful, um, we'd work that out with them and say, look, these are the positions we've got available. These are the hours that they are. Um, it's a rotating fortnightly roster. Um, so you'd be able to have a look at them and say, well, look, I wouldn't be able to commit to this or I'd be able to commit to this. Um, that's more of a discussion. Um, but it is really, really important that we find people that are right for the house. Uh, and for the people who are living in the house, um, it is a best fit. Um, we can hopefully work around some time restraints um, whilst making it fair on the other people who are working uh, to support those individuals as well. I've just got one more question that's come through. Anna, I hope I answered your question. Um, if I don't have a qualification, but have some experience supporting family members living with disability, should I still apply? and would Interchange be able to support me build my skills? Absolutely. Um, we find a lot of uh, parents and siblings um, or guardians um, who are supporting children or family members with disability um, who all of a sudden, um, you know, are in a different career, different industry, um, and they see an opportunity with us and they want to jump on board uh, feet first. Um, that level of experience that those family members or guardians have or, or friends have um, is really invaluable. Um, something that they understand quite often is that respect and that dignity of the person living with a disability. Um, so we often find that those individuals, um, whilst may not have a qualification, are highly skilled, um, particularly around delivering personal care um, or managing behaviours because they've been doing it for, for quite a long period of time. Um, and they just kind of understand it. So um, definitely, if you don't have a formal qualification, um, please do not hesitate to apply. Um, when you're answering key selection criteria, don't be afraid to put your personal experience in there. Don't be afraid in saying, when I've assisted my brother or my son or um, my daughter, my auntie, um, that's not a problem at all. So. Um, I've got one other question that's floated by and then I'm going to have to call it. I'm really sorry. Um, uh, the last question is, I have a disability. Can I apply? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, having a disability does not inhibit any way for anyone to be providing supports to uh, another individual with a disability. Um, obviously, there are some um, barriers that we may need to support the individual in overcoming. Um, but I would strongly encourage anyone who believes that they have the right passion um, and they've got um, the right fit for the role to apply for the role. Absolutely. So thank you all very much. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you uh, staying with us during our technical difficulties. Um, it can be a little bit challenging uh, to jump online. Uh, in these circumstances. I would really like to thank those people uh, who have jumped on today. Um, none of us really enjoy this type of line light. So um, thank you all very much for, for jumping on as well. Um, again, if you have any questions, please contact our HR department. Um, we would much rather hear questions 10 times over um, than have someone not apply at all. So thank you very much for your time. Have a wonderful weekend. See you guys.